Sorry, can you see the screen okay? Yes, I can. Very good. Um, great. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining today. Uh, we're talking today about information security, or uh, as well as information insecurity, depending on if you're a glass half full type of person. Um, oops, going real fast here. Uh, learning how to navigate. There we go. Um, my name is Eric Leland. I'm an Idealware expert trainer. Uh, I'm a founder uh, at Five Paths. Uh, which is based in Northern California. You can find us at fivepaths.com. We do a lot of uh, webinars for Idealware and other groups um, on a whole variety of topics. We build uh, and design websites and databases, uh, including uh, Drupal and Salesforce systems. Um, happy to be here. Uh, great to I'll be facilitating today. We also have a uh, color commentator today, uh, Elliot Sasaki. Uh, Elliot, would you mind uh, doing a brief introduction of yourself? Sure, thanks, Eric. Uh, so my name is Elliot. Uh, I'm a researcher, writer, and editor at the Legal Services Corporation. And my job is primarily just to highlight and share best practices and innovations in legal aid. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, you know, have a shameless plug. Um, I have a blog, Innovations in Legal Aid, um, on Medium. So I encourage you to go there uh, and check out the new posts and resources. And I'm just looking forward to um, talking to you guys today. And just feel free to reach out anytime with questions or if you want to work together. Thanks. Thanks, Elliot. Um, and we're also joined uh, today by uh, Angela, uh, Angela Tripp. Uh, Angela, would you mind doing just a brief introduction about uh, yourself? Sure. I'm the director of the Michigan Legal Help Program, which is Michigan's uh, resources for self-represented litigants. Um, our primary resource is the Michigan Legal Help website. Um, we also have 18 uh, brick and mortar self-help centers around the state um, where we try to uh, bring extra resources for self-represented litigants who want to use Michigan Legal Help to get the information and legal forms that they need. And awesome. just Thanks. a quick, quick note, we dropped the link to uh, Innovations in Legal Aid um, in the chat. So it is there. Great. Thank you. Um, great. And then, uh, Angela, you'll be uh, speaking a little bit uh, towards the end here about some of the uh, toolkits uh, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so thanks for being here for that. Great. Um, good. So uh, uh, this uh, webinar is uh, um, helped tremendously by uh, folks from Tech Impact uh, and Idealware. Idealware is uh, now a project of Tech Impact, uh, so this is a uh, recent uh, positive change. Um, Idealware is bringing lots of um, trainings uh, as well as reviews of software uh, and best practices around technology for NGOs. If you haven't checked out uh, their resources, you should check them out after this webinar at, at idealware.org. Um, and again, they're, they're now a part of Tech Impact, so techimpact.org as well is a, is a good resource to check out. Um, there's lots of free and low-cost um, resources, written reviews, short and longer comprehensive reviews, as well as recorded webinars and live webinars on all kinds of topics. So, so check them out. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be talking a, a lot about uh, information security and a lot of tools that are available in the Legal Aid Toolkit. Um, so there's a free download um, for this uh, toolkit uh, that you can check out. I will be referencing some of this as well. Uh, so ideally, um, you can kind of get your hands on that toolkit. Um, and I'm going to uh, make my screen small so that I can give you this link um, and put it in the chat here. Here we go. Uh, and I'll so this is screen. Angela. I'll just add that, um, that this webinar is also part of uh, a legal services technology grant funded project um, that created four toolkits for legal aid. Um, and this webinar is based um, largely um, on the information security toolkit that you can see here and download. Um, there are three other toolkits that are part of this project, um, and I'm going to talk more about them at the end of the webinar as well. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. Uh, so here's what we'll cover today. Uh, we're going to look at uh, why security needs your attention uh, now, not only now, but uh, in the future and ongoing, um, looking at risk. How do you figure that out? Um, checking out some examples of risky practices so you can kind of understand and think about whether those are things that are going on in your organization. Uh, looking at policies and processes for helping to you know, manage, mitigate those risks as best as you can. 
uh, as Angela mentioned, kind of diving a bit into the legal aid tech toolkits that have a lot of resources for helping out making these kinds of decisions and some additional resources as well. Um, so that's today. But first I want to hear from you. Um, maybe you can use the chat if you wouldn't mind in the uh, webinar software here. Uh, on a scale of one to four, let's say, uh, because there's not a fifth choice, are you very concerned, number one, all the way down to no concern, number four, uh, for data security? So if you're very concerned, number one, number two, number three, or four for not concerned at all, if you wouldn't mind chatting that um, for any folks that are listening, I'll give us a little sense of what you're thinking of here today. Um, just as a quick note, the um, dropping it into the questions box, we'll be able to see it, and I've already got a somewhat concerned and a two as responses so far. Let's see. Having seen some uh, of the problems, I would say. Yeah, that's uh, Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, I've got the questions open now. Great. That's a great place to drop it in. So I see uh, a couple of two somewhat concerned. Nobody's, like, super concerned, um, and nobody is also thinking this is meaningless. That's great. That's a healthy place to be. We don't want to be overzealous about the problem. We just want to have our heads on straight and start thinking through this. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, and dive in at, um, you know, what we're talking about here, um, a false sense of security. Let's kind of mitigate kind of how we might be thinking about security um, and kind of get our heads on straight about pragmatic approaches to sort of what's really going on with information security. Um, you know, it, in general, it's not a question of if you'll be hacked or compromised, but when. Um, that's not meant to be uh, extremely scary, but it's meant to just be reality. Um, Newer technologies, um, especially as they're on the cloud and becoming more ubiquitous in terms of being able to be used sort of wherever and whenever you are working, um, opens up new avenues for attack. So it's just, you know, based on that alone, you can imagine if you're able to access it anywhere with ease, uh, probably other folks are able to try to hack it from anywhere with ease. Um, so just because that's true doesn't mean you don't want to use it, right? So let's not go that far. We want technology. We need technology. Uh, but let's just understand the risks and be smart about it. Uh, security breaches, as you know, probably from the news, cost time and considerable money. Um, certainly can ruin brands um, and really create a lot of havoc in organizations. Um, some of you might remember in 2000, earlier in 2018, in Atlanta, um, the government computer files, they were essentially held hostage through what's called a ransomware attack. Uh, ransomware is a type of attack where uh, malware, so virus or other kinds of uh, bad things, gets into the computer system, locks down all the files so that the organization, in this case Atlanta, couldn't access any of their government files. Um, so it, it basically this attack encrypted, in other words, hid a big chunk of the city's files. To unlock all the files, the hackers demanded ransom, uh, approximately $51,000 uh, in Bitcoin, a cyber currency. Uh, and basically, the city was left in chaos. They couldn't access their files, so work kind of came to a essentially a standstill. Um, and it was one of the biggest cyber attacks against a major U.S. city. Uh, ultimately, they spent over $2.6 million in just emergency efforts to deal with this attack. I mean, that's way more than even the ransom asked for, right, um, in, in dealing with this. Um, so uh, it, it's just an example of, like, if we're not prepared uh, and, and we're not thinking through our strategies, these can be really, really big problems. They might be big problems anyway, but with a, with a plan in place, they don't have to be quite as big. Um, you know, we might have a false sense of security as I let out on the extreme end. We either don't care at all about security or it's so important or, or we're so scared of it that we tend to do things that, you know, remove uh, features and, and processes that we really need. Uh, so let's not be overwhelmed by possible threats. Let's just recognize what they are. Let's also not just gamble that we won't be targeted. Like, it hasn't happened to me yet. It's not going to happen to me, right? Uh, so just think through that. Uh, Elliot, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on just some of the threats maybe that we should be aware of, like what kinds of groups or who's trying to harm us? Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to, for, I think now is a good time to just define, I know you just mentioned, um, you know, that really no, no organization is safe from threats or attacks. 
um, and that ransomware is, is a very real threat. It's, um, you know, omnipresent today. Uh, but so just to review, a cyber threat is really um, any malicious act that tries to gain access to a computer um, or also a computer network uh, with, without authorization or permission from the owners. Um, and the numbers don't lie. There's really a lot of numbers um, out there that, that show that cybersecurity is something that you don't uh, want to take lightly. Um, so these threats, they really become actualized and they end up costing people and organizations um, around $450 billion per year globally, actually. I saw that um, number. And, and that's about a 200% increase, increase in cost from 2010 to 2015. So in just those five years, um, you know, the, just the cost of cyber threats and uh, cybersecurity has really grown. Um, and there's also about a million cyber attack victims daily. Uh, and to put that all in perspective even more, um, if cybercrime had been a country in, country in 2014, it would have been the 27th largest economy. Uh, so on the subject of su uh, successful attacks themselves, 99% um, of them are successful uh, because people and organizations fail to do the basics right. Um, whether you think you're doing the basics right, uh, you know, but you're doing them wrong, or you just have no idea, um, it's, it's really a widespread problem. And when I say basics, I'm talking about just up-to-date antivirus software, um, different and changing passwords, patches and updates to all systems, um, switching on anti-spam and anti-phishing options in email, um, implementing security layers and regular staff, uh, staff training and reinforcing a culture of security, um, and which is very important. It's, it's very important to have repeated uh, staff training um, as an organization throughout the year. Um, so what can you do to eliminate any false sense of security is to really educate yourself um, on the security threats and risks. Have a thorough understanding of the basics, build resilience, and this whole thing, um, cybersecurity, it's not going to go away. It doesn't solve itself with a snap of the fingers. And also, your organization needs to be really equipped to deal with the security concerns um, that this di uh, digital ecosystem presents. Uh, and one thing that was mentioned, just one line from the toolkit that I want to highlight right now, is that what was true 100 years ago is still true today. Uh, most security breaches are caused by natural disasters or improper activity by employees. And that improper activity, it could either be an intentional act by an employee um, for a nefarious purpose, because over a quarter, about 28% of attacks involve insiders. Um, or it could be simply someone who has clicked on a phishing campaign. Um, you know, a victim of social engineering or spoofing emails. Uh, it's very, very common, um, which is about 4% of people in total. Um, and then these numbers are from uh, a report from Verizon. And incredibly, uh, the more phishing emails someone has clicked, the more likely they are to do so again. So um, cybersecurity is it's, it's very important. Could, uh, Elliot, could you explain what phishing means? Yeah, so basically, um, the attacker will try to get um, will try to get you to click on a link, or um, will it'll most likely be in an email or a link, uh, and and uh, you know it's it's common to ransomware too, um, and. They'll just try to uh, get you to do a specific action that will most likely end up in, um, you know, you paying them. That's 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 a common result. Great, thank you. Um, good. So, uh, you know, avoiding security, um, it's not going to protect us. Remaining ignorant of the risks is not going to protect us. As Elliot said, we need to do some planning. We need to really figure out and start mitigating our risks and getting some better practices in place. Um, some of us may remember uh, the uh, hack of Equifax, 148 million Americans had their personal data stolen. Um, and in the case of Equifax, especially in those early days when, when, that, when the hack was sort of revealed, um, some of the argument from Equifax is, came out as we didn't know any better or it really wasn't our responsibility kinds of conversations. Um, that didn't work. Um, definitely wasn't something that was pleasing to certainly the people that were hacked and a lot of the regulators involved. Um, so that's not a legal defense. That's not a defense we should be using here either. 
Um, so some of the vectors for attacks, uh, vectors being sort of where they're coming from, how they're trying to attack you. Uh, Elliot mentioned some of these, you know, physical access to your systems, user error, right? Like we do something wrong because we're not following best practices as, as people. Uh, malicious user acts, we're intentionally doing something wrong. Uh, you know, stealing credentials, logins, that sort of thing. Uh, installing software, exploiting security holes that exist. Um, these are all kinds of things that can, uh, you know, can be vectors for attacks. Um, you know, hackers, uh, generally speaking, are, are, are pros. Um, that, that this doesn't necessarily mean that they're, uh, you know, have taken sort of, you know, college level classes in hacking per se, but they're focused, right? Um, they know what they're doing, they know what they're looking for. Um, and, and they're not necessarily, uh, carrying one way or another what the site particularly is. They're looking for valuable information. So they're not filtering out whether you're a nonprofit do get, doing something good, doing something uh, otherwise in, in m many of these cases. Uh, if there's valuable information, they'll take it. Um, so if you maintain financial information, you know, donation amounts and addresses, pledge information, credit card information, banking information, if you maintain sensitive information such as, you know, health information, disability, uh, you know, personal lifestyle orientation, political affiliation. Maybe you have contact information just for folks, mailing addresses, phone numbers, email addresses. This is all valuable information. These are things you need to protect. They go for large amounts of money when they're stolen and sold uh, to others. Um, and so you might be a target, um, just and definitely be a target just because of the valuable information. You may also be a target because of your mission itself. You know, highly uh, dedicated advocacy organizations, for instance, folks working on real hot button issues might be particularly target target, so more susceptible to malicious attacks of various kinds. Um, so be aware of that um, as far as vectors. Um, are small nonprofits attractive targets? Uh, yes, uh, they are attractive tar targets. Um, in general, small organizations, not necessarily just nonprofits. Uh, are assumed, and it's often true, to have uh, less uh, levels of protection that larger corporations will have, um, just as a as a bias. So they're seen as low hanging fruit. Um, again, a lot of the attacks are not necessarily uh, directed at specific small businesses or nonprofits, but they'll might be sweeping the web with code, trying to find vulnerabilities, and they'll tend to find those in systems um, that haven't been protected as well, which, which will be smaller organizations. Um, so it kind of goes both ways. Smaller organizations tend to be not as well protected, so they're vulnerable and discovered. Uh, they're also targeted because they may, in fact, be more vulnerable and easier to break. Um, Elliot, I wonder if you have any thoughts about targeting and specifically kind of small organizations and nonprofits to share. Yeah, I just wanted to, thanks Eric, I just wanted to frame this a little bit more. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago just the whole uh, government attack in Atlanta. Well, there have been a couple ones recently, um, particularly that pertains to um, law and legal aid. Uh, so last year, in the summer of 2017, um, the global law firm DLA Piper uh, was hit with a NotPetya ransomware attack, um, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, it was a huge attack. Um, actually commonly referred to as the most devastating cyber attack in history. And, um, you know, it really crippled the firm's office here in Washington, D.C., and put roughly 3,600 attorneys and support staff across 40 countries on lockdown. And it was really spread out. The incident and in recovery uh, efforts lasted for weeks. Um, and during that whole time, the telephone service, their email, um, and other vital systems were all affected. And in total, the attack cost the firm millions of dollars in downtime, lost business, and bad publicity. Um, and more recently, as a snapshot, um, just actually last month in October, uh, ransomware took down at least three law firms in Florida um, in just a span of a few short weeks. So why are law firms, small businesses, and nonprofits attractive targets? Uh, according to Verizon's data uh, breach investigations report, which I just mentioned 58% of victims are small businesses. Um, and that's because, you know, nonprofits collect, we collect sensitive data, social security numbers, confidential emails, uh, health and financial information, and, and much more that's really attractive um, to hackers and attackers. 
And in many cases, nonprofits are targets because they're less likely to have sophisticated security measures. Um, one that was another attack was also on this small nonprofit called Little Red Door. And um, this was in 2017. They had their data stolen from their server and held ransom for, it was another Bitcoin ransom for 50 Bitcoin, which at the time was about um, $40,000, give or take. Uh, if the nonprofit paid the hacker's claim, then they would return their data and not publish it. Um, and nonprofit's leadership weighed their op options and decided, thought that they didn't have any data that was too sensitive, so they didn't pay. Um, but actually, that kind of backfired because the hackers took to Twitter, um, posted the, the private grief letters um, to the families of clients who had passed away. Uh, so needless to say, the organization was traumatized. Um, and this, this just all goes to show that nonprofits need to recognize that they're more vulnerable to cybercrime and security risks than they probably think. Um, and while possessing sensitive data makes them attractive targets, um, what really does them in, like I said, is their security infrastructure, um, which is often characterized by common pit, uh, pitfalls, such as delegating the security problem to IT only, um, throwing a bunch of resources at the problem and treating it more of a more as a compliance issue. Great, thanks, Elliot. Um, yeah, so a lot, some of these uh, ideas of sort of how to deal with process um, and, and mitigating these risks, we'll touch on again uh, as, as we move forward and then the next sections. So uh, overall, what we need to understand is, you know, sort of how to assess risk. What are your risks? Um, you know, to stay on focus, not too much focus, not too little focus. We assess the risk within our own organizations and determine the actions we need to take to mitigate them. So that's what I want to move into um, at this point is, is what does it look like to uh, assess um, our risks as or nonprofits? Uh, first of all, um, it's a process. Uh, we, you know, you have to start looking deeper into your systems and processes for managing information to even begin to determine your risk. Um, so to deep dive, uh, where is this information being stored um, that you're dealing with um, and, and sort of how is it being stored and managed? Um, Elliot, do you have a experiences or sort of best practices to share around sort of, you know, getting started with assessing and, and, and the process of, of learning about risk? Well, I actually do have a long metaphor, if that's okay. <laughs> and yeah, I, sure. I swear this is. This is um, going to be my only long metaphor of the day, and it's kind of roundabout. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, directly applicable, um, but uh, just bear with me; it'll get there. Um, so, if you're a sports fan or live in Philadelphia, you're familiar with the Philadelphia 76ers, um, the NBA team. They last won the NBA championship in the early 1980s, 1983, um, and they were good again when Allen Iverson played for them. And since then, they've been mediocre at best for a long time. Um, and the thing is, in the NBA, if you're mediocre, uh, you might be good enough to make the playoffs, but then you'll lose to a really good team. And But then, in turn, you uh, miss out on having a good pick in the draft and picking a really good player. So the 76ers were mediocre. And in 2013, they hired this guy, Sam Hinkey, um, from another team. And he's this kind of quirky analytics first guy. And he's he basically says uh, we're you know we're going to strip this team for parts, and he pretty much got rid of all their good players, um, and they were terrible. The next year they won ten games out of you know the whole season. Uh, they had the third worst record in NBA history. Um, but the thing is, and and this is applicable, um, you know, to legal aid organizations and cybersecurity is that he had the buy-in, the resources, and he saved the course. Um, he drafted. He drafted this guy uh, named Joel Embiid, who a few years before he got drafted was living in Cameroon, didn't speak English, didn't play basketball. Um, he drafted him already knowing he was going to miss his first season. He actually missed two. And then the next season, he drafted Ben Simmons, um, this Australian kid who looked really good on tape, played in a very marginal basketball conference, got injured, completely missed his first year after being drafted, just like Embiid. And then the 76ers were terrible. But then Embiid came back. He was amazing. Simmons was healthy for a second year. And then now the 76ers are in a position to compete uh, thanks to Hink, uh, Hinky and trusting the process. So um, the takeaway here after all this is to really trust the process. 
it might take a while and there might be several or more than uh, several big expenses, but it'll be worth it in the end. Um, and the Hinky experiment worked because it involved the whole, the whole organization. Like I said, he had buy-in and he looked at the data. Um, ESPN named Hinky's Sixers in 2015 as the major professional sports franchise at Most Embrace Analytics. Um, and the same goes for legal aid programs. Um, but, but your organization really needs to be vested in IT governance, um, which will help lower your security risks and will also help you properly respond to a security incident. Yeah, that's great. And I think it's, uh, it's great advice to, to stay the course, sort of d dig in um, and play the long game here because best practices over a longer period of time will be substantially beneficial for uh, improving security. Um, you know, getting to this point, just sort of uh, getting into the pragmatics here, uh, the toolkit, as we mentioned earlier, um, has a lot of good resources. There's a, a worksheet on page six, in fact, uh, of, of the uh, first volume of the toolkit that uh, just helps you organize your data. So you can go uh, in your organizations, find where the data is, uh, describe it uh, on this sheet, and then start really kind of thinking about it. Um, you know, how much, how important is it? What happens? What would happen should it go away? Uh, how likely is it to be compromised? You know, various elements like that. So you can start thinking through what this data really means to you. Uh, what's the sort of the, the risks involved? Uh, should this data be compromised in some way? Uh, so that's in the toolkit. Um, as we've said, you know, inventory your data. Uh, you can think of different ways to, to do this. Just figure out where you keep your data. Um, you know, you might want to do this as a group. Uh, there's lots of data that's formalized into systems that, you know, everyone in the organization kind of knows about. There's the database or, or whatever you call it. Uh, there's going to often be uh, lots of data in informal locations that you don't know about. So a certain staff person has a whiz-bang way to deal with some data. Uh, and it's not in the main system and no one really knows about it, right? We want to know about all sources of data because we want to understand how critical is it, uh, what's its sort of uh, uh, likelihood uh, that it might be compromised in some ways, whether it's by user error or some kind of malicious act or all these other vectors. Uh, you can get together as a team, you know, put them, write down all the sources, you know, maybe you can use sticky notes or whatever method you want to do, but the idea is to kind of find where the data is, group it together in terms of systems. You can figure out which systems kind of have all your important data, perhaps, or a lot of it, and some systems may not. Right? So that can help you kind of from a systems point of view say, well, the system isn't as critical, but this other one is. Um, that's, you know, a way of scoping your efforts as well. So this inventory step is a pretty important part of the process. Um, we should also uh, try to define, um, did I skip one? Here we go. This is what I want to show. Uh, we want to uh, classify the information. Uh, so basically, further defining how essential your data is along these metrics, such as how confidential is it? How integral is it should it disappear on you? In other words, if you don't have access to the information, is it integral to the work you do or, or not so much? Um, and how available must it be for critical functioning? Is it sort of all the time, real-time information you gotta have at a moment's notice? Is it not so much like that? Um, so you can kind of rate and classify your information on those metrics to understand essentially how important it is. Um, you'll also want to consider risks. Um, you know, work with your colleagues really to discuss these potential risks. You want to do this as a group so that you can kind of share and collaborate on folks' experiences uh, as well as the kind of data you're using and how important it is for their work at the organization. Uh, you can use these kind of questions on the slide to help guide that conversation. Um, you know, what could happen to your data? How likely is it to happen? How bad would it be if something were to happen? Have those conversations, um, you, you know, figure out what could happen. You know, are you guys concerned about identity theft and fraud um, from maybe, you know, even staff from folks that are walking into the office? Is it lost time, lost productivity in certain cases? Maybe uh, equipment might get damaged because you run, uh, you know, a public access system where folks are coming in and out of your location. Um, maybe increased expenditures is, is a big concern or legal liability based on perhaps losing donors and having to announce to all your donors, hey, I'm sorry, but you've been compromised. Destruction of reputation, loss of funding, this sort of thing. Um, so consider the risks as, as part of a, a group. Um, Elliot, just curious if you, if 
if there's any other kind of risks you would kind of want to throw out there if, if folks are meeting as a group to kind of, you know, determine what might be a, a risk to them? Um, no, not too much. I, I'd just say, uh, you know, just to consider your on-site risks, your off-site risks, um, and, you know, just, I guess, just be cautious of, uh, you know, social engineering and um, spoofing. That's about it. Yeah, agreed. Um, thank you. Let's let's move in then to uh, talking about actually the, some of the risky practices, the uh, seven risky practices that uh, you all may be engaged in, um, uh, or at least some of these, and we'll make, make you aware of them and sort of what they mean and, and what we can do about them in terms of taking action to mitigate these risks. Uh, so looking at the first one, unmanaged personal devices. Um, essentially, to ask yourself the question, do, you, do your staff use personal devices for work? Um, it, you know, it, often organizations will have some practices in place to help secure um, your equipment that's on-premise already. So the, the perhaps the laptops or the workstations uh, devices that your organization is already providing as part of your work, uh, that might have some policy in place for your teams. But that often leaves out the other devices that folks are increasingly bringing in. We have smartphones, laptops, tablets, you know, all kinds of internet-enabled devices that people are bringing in now. You know, are, ask yourself, are these a source of insecurity for your organization? Um, likely the answer is yes. Um, it's important to realize that when, when folks are bringing in these, these systems that um, are, are, you know, often consumer-level systems that are meant to be really easy to use, share information, to get messages in and out. They're quite powerful. Um, you can't control access uh, nearly as well um, when folks bring in their own uh, systems and, and you haven't thought through necessarily processes and systems for managing those. So a personal device uh, such as a, a phone or a, or a laptop or whatever may have other users who can access data. Um, you know, terminated employees may have, you know, they retain knowledge of, of course, their usernames and passwords. They might have information that's stored that's, you know, part of uh, your organization that's also on their private devices. Um, personal systems often have poor passwords and password management. Um, folks might set an easy password and sort of never change it. Uh, and it's not subject to the management that you might have in place for your other systems inside your organization. Um, so all, all of these can sort of lead to compromises that can then infect, you know, your nonprofit system just because folks brought these in. Um, so there's some things to think about there. You, you know, there, there are tools for helping control this. Um, there are uh, software tools called mobile device management systems. Um, the acronym is MDM, mobile device management. Uh, this software uh, can be implemented to help uh, sort of for devices that folks are bringing into the organization, the software can kind of be put onto those devices and help govern sort of how those devices work within the organization, right? So it allows you to have some level of control or access around how those are used or not used, as it were, uh, in the organization. Uh, so, so something to think about. It, it can feel a bit like Big Brother on one hand, but, you know, with the right kind of adjustments to settings or whatnot, uh, it can be a really valuable way to control uh, outside uh, technology being brought into the office. Uh, there's, of course, virus and malware risk. Uh, this is something that, that a lot of us uh, understand more intuitively just from uh, years of experience of dealing with emails. Um, but, you know, on personal devices, uh, often they don't have antivirus installed, or maybe they did at one point or still do, but the, that the software hasn't been maintained. So it's quite out of date. Uh, it may even be running, uh, but not really doing anything. Um, so the security software itself might not be really credible. In other words, it's not like a good cleaner for virus or malware, even if it is up to date, um, because your team has decided there's a certain credible tool, and, you know, the tools being brought in are, are not. Um, so, you know, how do you know personal computers and devices have these basic protections? Um, you really don't unless you're doing some management process around this. Something that folks don't think about um, as much, at least in my conversations, is the ownership of software. It's a different sort of risk. Um, it, you know, staff using personal devices may install software that you've paid for as a nonprofit, you know, because they want to work on it anywhere and maybe they don't have that capacity with equipment that's on at the nonprofit or it's just easier for them to use their own 
personal laptop. So, you know, you buy the software, they install it on the personal laptop. Uh, now, you know, you uh, have bought the software as a nonprofit, but the personal, the staff person actually personally owns the license, right? It's like literally on their laptop. Um, also, that means that there's, you know, obviously going to be more information that's stored on the laptop that's not theirs, it's the nonprofits, right? So, you know, just be aware of software management. So you might be purchasing the software but not controlling the license. Um, that leads to, to risks and information getting out. So just on this topic, on, on the first uh, uh, risky behavior, what can you do? Um, you can, you know, look at providing virus and malware software. Uh, definitely you want to have these licensing practices as we just talked about. Uh, so you know sort of who's getting licenses and how they're being sort of installed and managed and maintained. Uh, if you can provide devices for work so that folks aren't tempted to use their own, or at least that's reduced, that's a great thing. Maybe mobile device management systems, um, you can use these software. Um, there's a note here that they can be quite expensive. Uh, they're, they're actually becoming more accessible now. Uh, Microsoft Office 365 has a built-in mobile device management uh, uh, system that's more affordable. Uh, and the Google Cloud G Suite, another sort of uh, 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 productivity suite, uh, Google Cloud also has um, an MDM software as well. And, and there's a variety of others. So uh, don't write it off. It might have some expense. Some are very expensive, but some are becoming more and more affordable as we move forward. All right, let's look at another bad habit, lack of password management. Um, you know, this, I, I like this chart because there's always, always these passwords that sort of year after year after year are in the top 10, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So anyway, you can see where a lot of folks are just, oh, whatever, I just want to type in a password, right? And we've all been there. I'm ashamed to admit I've been there. Um, but, you know, if a lot of folks are using weak, weak passwords, uh, then it's going to be very easy for the systems to be compromised with very little effort, right? Um, so um, it's funny to note that uh, I love you has come back into the top 10 in 2018 as a password. Uh, it's always fighting for a spot in the top 10 there. Um, how do we know this, by the way? There's an internet security firm called uh, Splash Data that's published a list of sort of top 10 passwords from 2011. Are they hacking systems to figure this out? No, they don't need to because there's so many systems that are being hacked, right? They're looking at data from millions of leaked passwords and data breaches, mostly in North America and Western Europe to come up with these lists, right? Um, so let's not have bad passwords. Um, some other bad habits around passwords. Um, I'm definitely been guilty of some of these. Sharing passwords of coworkers, uh, bad habit. We wanna get folks to not do that uh, as part of a culture change. Not changing the default passwords um, at home, uh, you know, probably even in many of our workplaces, uh, we might have internet routers or modems installed. Maybe someone installed them for us and they or we don't bother to change their passwords. I can't tell you how many times in the past five years I've helped troubleshoot someone's modem or router at their home and the password has been left at password, P-S-S-W-O-R-D. Pretty simple one to guess, right? Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a point of, insecurity. The internet device, the router, and the modem is literally what's letting in uh, the World Wide Web, you know, into your home or your office. Um, so look at this problem. Are you sharing default passwords? Are you sharing passwords at all? Are you changing your passwords? Are you writing them down and leaving them? Uh, trying to keep things too simple. Let's get out of these bad habits. What can you do about this, uh, uh, this risk factor? Um, you can definitely implement password management software. Um, there's pass password management software such as, you know, one login. Uh, other options are Dashlane, LastPass, Keeper, uh, thinking log me once is another one. Uh, and these, these systems allow you to really, you know, you want to have complex passwords. You want to change them on a regular basis, but it's almost impossible, probably impossible for nearly everybody to remember the, all these passwords you need. So you use these password management softwares to help you do that. They're meant to be secure and, and a way for you to use and deploy these passwords when you need them. Uh, you know, they're not immune to being hacked too. So like anything else, we need to be concerned about security. In fact, the one mentioned on the slide, one login, 
uh, I believe, I don't know, Elliot, if you know more about this, maybe you do. But in 2017, I believe they were hacked um, themselves. It was quite embarrassing for a company that's supposed to be managing passwords securely. Um, I, I, Elliot, have you heard of that one? No, no, I haven't actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So LastPass uh, was hacked, um, as uh, yeah. although they did notice at the time and helped people update. Um, a lot of people have said, well, I don't want them in a central place because then there's a target here. But the chances are that people have been hacked and they don't know it. So having that third party that is going to be more likely to notice um, and monitoring things, I think is much more secure. Yeah, agreed. So it's not meant to say, oh my God, I can't trust anybody, right? Like these, these password management systems are are strong tools. Um, it's just, you know, you, you always want to be prudent about understanding and, and reading and exploring sort of just what they're doing with with uh, with their management practices around security uh, so that you can at least be aware of them, make sure it fits uh, the policies and procedures that you have in place. Great, all right, let's look at the uh, next one. So number three, uh, consumer grade cloud storage. Um, so, uh, you know, to be clear, the risk is consumer grade storage. Any kind of cloud storage ultimately, is, you know, I, I might argue is more secure than on-premise storage, not always. But the idea is, is that commonly our on-premise storage, like in within our organizations, uh, we're not going to have nearly sort of the, the security protocols in place as these uh, consumer grade or uh, and um, and business grade uh, cloud storage of, of any kind, just because it's part of the fundamental part of their business is to have um, increased security, probably more so than an individual nonprofit will have in most cases. Uh, having said that, consumer grade storage uh, has problems from a management point of view. So, for instance, if if you're using, um, well, I don't know, you know, Dropbox or or Google uh, Google Cloud for file storage or a number of these tools, Box things like this. Um, if you're using them on a consumer level, there isn't really a way to deal with um, knowing sort of audit logs, like who's touched what files. Um, there's there's not a way for administrators to learn, you know, whether a user has changed, been added, subtracted, or so forth. Um, you know, typically they allow full access, so users that are using these systems are sort of fully able to add, delete, and mass files, right, which might not be something you want to do because that risks compromising information. Um, so just be aware that consumer grade cloud cloud storage may not have enough of the tools you need to help manage and mitigate some of the risks. Um, and these business controls can help you control sort of how and whether the data moves, you know, according to your rules. Uh, so, so something to consider. Also, these these sort of cloud storage systems are becoming quite easy to set up, so they can sort of pop up, you know, at anywhere at any time within the organization. Um, so, you know, again, you just need to be aware that this technology going uh, around the organization sort of um, because it's easy um, and it's a very low hanging fruit. And so you kind of need to start thinking and talking about that on a regular basis. Um, personal accounts uh, in these cloud storage areas might be free, um, you know, so they can start to be, you know, very inexpensive and seems like a good way to go financially. But of course, you know, if you're not managing your security, then you're increasing your risk. And, and as we've seen in some of the previous stories, these risks can be quite cataclysmic if security is breached because, you know, very important data is stored in, in relatively unmanaged systems. So uh, cheaper is not necessarily uh, less expensive. So what can you do about this uh, issue? Uh, definitely we wanna, um, you know, think about if we're using the cloud storage that we're going to use business grade and what we're really looking for when we're looking for sort of the business level which will cost more in most cases is what are those management tools management tools uh, around sort of access to the data audit users and, and a variety of these tools where we can mitigate uh, and, and understand sort of what's going on in these cloud storage systems uh, let's establish policies on what kind of content can be stored in these cloud platforms if you decide that they have risk right and and um, but you still want to use them for certain purposes. You may not want to use them for other more uh, sensitive purposes, right? So, in what circumstances are these best applied? Again, make sure you're educating everyone who's using these about the risks, so that folks know how to use these tools appropriately, and that you keep keep doing that over time, so that folks aren't forgetting. Um, 
there's a couple of tools for helping manage these cloud services. Uh, the, the few that I know of, um, Better Cloud is, a, is the name of one. Um, cloud Manager is another one. They're tools that, are, that sort of you can layer on top of, like maybe Google Cloud software, for instance. You can layer these tools on top of that to help you manage some of these security concerns. You know, as a, as a as a separate service that you buy. Um, so so there's other ones that that do you know add some management layers. So you can kind of look at those as well if you're finding that these cloud services, especially some of these consumer level ones, are really important for your work and you want to mitigate some of those risks. Certain things you can do. Great. Uh, number four, poor backup infrastructure. Um, so it, you know, in in California, I'm I'm. Uh, working out of Northern California and, and in California across 2018, we've had a series of really devastating wildfires. There's been a, uh, several nonprofits that I've been working with, um, that, you know, have fully burned down. Um, so their offices are gone. Um, and in one particular case, the organization actually had a, uh, backup strategy they've been using for many years. Um, uh, but unfortunately they didn't account for the entire office burning down, right? So they, they thought they had a good strategy, but in fact, they really didn't because they weren't thinking about backups being somewhere else, right, besides their office. Luckily, uh, a director had accidentally put a system backup in their bag and brought it home about a week before the fires hit, uh, which is, I find it to be an interesting story because, you know, on one hand, you could look at it and be like, well, how the heck is this, you know, director just sort of willy-nilly getting a backup of the entire system sort of in their bag? Like, that's kind of a security risk. On the other hand, you can look at this positively and say they had enough of a process in place that, you know, by some luck, but also because they had a process of doing backups at all, they actually still had a backup, right? Um, and they brought it home. And so it's just sort of a, a story to say that having some processes in place are certainly better than none at all. Uh, in this case, they got really lucky. Their process actually worked and their insecurity in one case actually worked to their benefit. <laughs> um, but let, let's remember that um, we want to have backup infrastructure we want to understand what will happen in a disaster, what kinds of disasters are likely to happen to you, have those conversations, uh, and figure out how to handle your backup strategy. You know, we want our backups to be in a safe place. Um, uh, if you can, store it, you know, physically off-site. You know, cloud uh, solutions is a great way uh, for doing backups because you can have backups that are stored on-premise. You can have backups that are stored sort of in the cloud, meaning not on-premise. Um, you know, if you want to do a, a, a third, you can have someone sort of be, you know, putting those cloud backups somewhere else, but locally and within reach. Um, but in that case, you're, you're making sure that you're covering your bases around there. Uh, you want to think beyond, um, the backup. So, you know, in one story, um, an organization I was working with had backups for years and years and years, a very sophisticated system. Um, they had backups in three locations and so forth. Um, you know, they ran rolling backups for like a couple of weeks and then one a month and they had these sort of archives for quite some time. Well, what they didn't do is actually test their backups, right? So they were backing up and these files are being created, but the files are corrupt, right? So the backups actually could not be restored. Um, and so when they had a cataclysmic break several years ago and needed to restore from backup, none of them worked for oh, a good two years. Um, so think beyond the backup. You know, what will you do if the data is unavailable? Do you know actually how to restore from backup? What's your process in place for, for not only dealing and getting those backups and making sure they're working and understanding how to use them uh, in a crisis, right? Um, it's pretty important stuff. So what can you do? Definitely regularly schedule backups. Um, a lot of system servers and, lap and, uh, and workstations have built in tools for uh, doing those backups. There's cloud-based backup systems that can you can run and automate to make that happen. Your websites and so forth um, often have web hosts that will provide backups as well. Understand how those work, uh, run them, and practice actually using those backups. Um, and make sure you're checking from time to time that the systems are working, right, so that you feel confident going forward that folks know how to use them and that they, in fact, are working. Uh, a couple things you can do there. Let's look at another risk. Um, poor software management. Um, software requires frequent ma maintenance. There's threats against software um, all the time that's constantly evolving to be more effective at breaking in. And software vendors or open source communities or whomever is sort of helping to drive the software forward 
is constantly putting out updates and patches to, to try to guard against this. Um, so, so make sure that you're asking the question, is the software your team using safe? Like how, you know, who is looking at the software? Nobody? Is somebody doing it? What are their practices? Explore that and figure out what's missing. Um, so, you know, software that requires you to choose to do the update, the security update is probably overall not very secure. Many of us will just put off the update until later and then quite often later never comes. Um, I've been guilty of that. My Mac always reminds me to update and I say, oh, I have to come back. Um, and then it asks me, well, do you want to schedule it? And I say, no. Um, so don't follow that model. Like we want to do updates, um, on, on a regular basis. We want to be on top of when security releases are happening. Keep in mind that when software is released uh, and a security update is released, particularly, that's also identifying a security hole. If folks didn't already know about the hole, they now do right? Because there's been a security update. <laughs> um, and so if you didn't patch with the security update, then somebody else is inevitably trying to, you know, exploit that hole that's now been described to them. Uh, so that's why it's good to keep on top of these things. Um, so hackers are keeping up to date. They're always looking for opportunities to exploit them. Uh, they're going to be on it right away. So you can be on it as well um, and just be timely with your updates. Keep in mind that poor software management also means that folks might be installing uh, applications you don't want. Um, folks might be, oh, I don't know, downloading music. They might be uh, watching videos or storing lots of files. Maybe they're mining cryptocurrency, Bitcoin to try to make millions. Um, and that's, that's creating a lots of computer cycles and, and using up a lot of resources. Uh, maybe some of the applications being downloaded actually have some adware or malware in it because you know they just hadn't thought about that. Um, so again, these could be intentional or unintentional problems from unwanted applications. So having, having some thought about what you're installing um, is important. So basically what it comes down to is we want to have these established patch management procedures. Let's make sure that our software is being kept up to date on a regular basis. Know the schedules if you're running, say, like a Drupal CMS website, for instance. Drupal of releases updates every Wednesday, right? Know that schedule so you can work that in. Other softwares might release on other kinds of basis or sort of all, all the time ongoing. They might have criteria for what's really insecure and what's sort of insecure. So you can kind of respond differently to depending on how severe the problem is. So establish those procedures. Manage those software installations, whether it's your own patch procedure, but more importantly, what other folks might be installing or just what you, how you decide what is going to be installed across the network or on individual workstations. Uh, make sure you're doing a regular tune-up. How well are computers working uh, with this software? Are they being sort of generally updated even with non-critical updates? Uh, keep in mind that if folks' computer systems start to work poorly, that's when folks will start to have workarounds. Like if there's some easier, quicker solution to getting their work done, my computer doesn't work so well and there's another application that helps, you know, I'm going to be inclined to use it and maybe not look at the security issues. Let's look at number six, uh, physical security. Is your office protected itself? This goes back to the fires, right? Um, so folks are working in these fire prone areas. You know, you may have a fire. Uh, is your office protected? Maybe not. Probably you can assume that it might get totally burned down. Uh, so you have to deal with that. Um, I asked a web hosting vendor years ago to send me, as I was doing some review, to send me some documentation on their physical security practices. And they sent me back, you know, a page that was describing all their physical security at their web hosting facility. And they also sent me this giant photo of a heavily armed man with a submachine gun standing in front of the building where their servers were, right? I, I think that was supposed to be impressive. Of course, I asked what they did with how they protect the back door, right? Because that was the front door. Um, but sort of all humor aside, the... The physical security is pretty important. You might have folks walking in and out of your workplace, at staff certainly, um, but you might have others, uh, folks working at night in the building, um, cleaning or other maintenance crews, building management. You have volunteers and clients coming in potentially. Um, you might even have uh, folks, if you're in a shared environment, you have folks from other offices or so forth kind of wandering around. Um, of course, intruders, like maybe uh, you're in a, a situation where there might be a lot of crime or folks trying to come in. Um, so think about that. 
would it be easy for folks to steal computers? Do you have a bunch of computers right at the doorway? Uh, you know, what if someone walks into the door? Uh, think about physical security. Um, you know, we want to keep not only uh, the malicious people from getting computers, but, you know, we also want to keep the, uh, quote, honest people honest as well, right? If it's easy to sort of swipe a computer, let's make it not so easy. Let's make it not so easy. So what can you do about this? Um, establish secure areas uh, where non-staff members are, are not allowed, right? Um, so make sure you understand who's there um, and, and that you're controlling kind of access generally to your office. Uh, check out policies for when folks are using shared devices or other assets at the organization. They can lock computers, things like this. Um, Elliot, I'm wondering on, on this one or any of the other sort of tips, uh, do you have some recommendations or ideas around physical security? Yeah, well, I just wanted to highlight um, three things that uh, that are in the um, Idealware Info Information Security Toolkit, um, and that's that you should uh, really have your well, your physical space should really be configured to keep your data secure, and um, you know, and that's by three things: locking the door, securing equipment, and logging off of machines. Um, these are the most important things you can do. Um, and so, which leads to the question, um, you know, I want you to t uh, t just take a second and think about, you know, what physical security controls, processes, and procedures um, do you guys have in place at your organization? Yeah, um, and it is important to take that second or minute or hour, actually, to, to think about those procedures. And, and, and logging out is, is very important. We hadn't mentioned that previously, so thanks for bringing that up, Elliot. Um, good. Well, let's talk about uh, the seventh one, um, unsafe Wi-Fi. We kind of touched on this earlier, but is your connection to the internet secure? You know, Wi-Fi is great. It's all around you. Um, and because of that, you can connect wherever you are in range. But of course, anyone else um, who's picking up that Wi-Fi signal can also potentially connect. Um, so we need to make sure our Wi-Fi is protected. Um, you know, again, you can't just sort of plug in these systems and expect that it's just going to, going to be fine. It'll probably work. They're being sold to just sort of work as much as possible out of the box, but that doesn't mean they're secure. Um, so you want to sort of configure those, right? You want to select the highest level of encryption available on your router, your modem, your combination units. Um, ensure that the passphrases, first of all, that you've changed them. And second of all, that they're long and more complicated. Um, you know, you can also uh, establish zones, basically as uh, zones where staff devices are granted more access than non-staff devices, right? So you can kind of let those device, let those internet devices know which which um, computers are sort of more allowed or less allowed. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of these uh, basic infrastructure on Wi-Fi that, that tend to be sort of not configured at all for security around offices and homes, so, so just be aware of that. Uh, you know, working on public Wi-Fi can be uh, pretty risky. Uh, ideally, you're, you could try to limit publicly available Wi-Fi usage for uh, laptops, uh, mobile devices that will be coming in and out of the office. Um, if you do use them, you can use those that you trust. Um, it's important that when you do use them that you're visiting uh, resources. So if you're sitting in the coffee shop and you're going to a website uh, and you're using sort of the the publicly available Wi-Fi. You want to go to websites that have encryption, so they, you know, have HTTPS as the beginning of their web address, which just means that you're communicating to the website. Uh, your information is coming to you and going towards that website uh, encrypted, so that it's uh, very, very difficult to read. Uh, so they can't snoop what you're doing. Um, try to avoid public Wi-Fi to ask a lot of personally identifying information just to sort of get going, especially when not encrypted. Sometimes you just to sign up, you have to give them a bunch of information and you're not on HTTPS, so then that information can all, you know, be looked at by someone else. Um, also something to consider is that you're, the computer you're using in a public Wi-Fi space might have what's known as um, frictionless file sharing. Basically, this concept that you want to, you know, to, to be easy um, and efficient, it's great that you can kind of seamlessly share files from your computer to something else. Um, but that can allow folks that are on a on the same network to kind of see, maybe even grab or share with you files that you don't want to. Um, so it's 
fairly straightforward on your PC or Mac to kind of turn off some of these sort of file sharing features. You can look up frictionless file sharing online and kind of, if you're in a coffee shop, just sort of shut that stuff down um, while you're using it. Just something to think about. So what can you do? Uh, again, make sure you're, you're protected. Um, if you're using these modems and routers, you know, that you've got the firewall enabled, that you've got the password changed, um, highest level en encryption set that you can. Uh, try to avoid working in unsecure environments or work as securely as possible within those unsecure environments. Um, so some things to think about. Um, Let's just find out from you. I think we did a we did a poll earlier. I think you put it into the questions section. So if you wouldn't mind uh, just sharing with us um, what risky habits you're guilty of by number. Um, do you have unmanaged personal devices in your uh, nonprofits or in your past? Lack of password management? Uh, any of these items that you could share? Just the kinds of uh, risky habits that might occur to you um, by number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the chat. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, answers here. Um, one, unmanaged personal devices. This is really, really common and pretty unavoidable. Maybe not so much the unmanaged part, but certainly having personal devices um, is, is becoming very common. Uh, in the organizations I'm working at, uh, still a lack of good password management is happening. Um, a lot of applications that can be configured to help with password management, like a lot of the organizations we're working with, are using Salesforce CRM, which has a lot of great password management tools, but they're not turned on. Uh, so they're not forcing changing passwords and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's a big one. Okay, great. Um, so that gets us to the, uh, the the seven risky behaviors, but of course there's, there's another one. Uh, the eighth is probably the most important. Um, inadequate security training. Uh, really, your, your, your staff members, folks working in your organizations are the most important security measure. Um, you're only as secure as your weakest link. You know, making sure your staff is not the weakest link, that they're really sort of up to speed with the, um, with the best case, uh, security practices that you put into place. And that there's become a culture of actually behaving in a more secure way, right? That you're kind of reinforcing and re-reinforcing over time how to behave more securely so that it becomes inculcated as part of the community. Um, I think, Elliot, you may have said this earlier about the security lapses. I think the figure I've, I've seen recently, seven, like roughly 70% of security lapses are ultimately a result of user action, not necessarily nefarious, but just sort of not following necessarily best practices. Is, does that jive with what you've heard? Yeah, it's pretty high. Pretty high, yeah. Um, yeah, so just be aware of this. Um, Awareness can prevent a lot of incidents. Um, just make sure that this team is aware that what can be insecure, kind of like what we talked about today. Um, a lot, a lot of times, these sort of threats are completely unknown to staff. They tend to be fairly interesting to talk about. Um, and, and in my experience, folks can have like a lot of aha moments, like, "Oh my gosh, I've heard of that," or "Really, that can happen? I didn't even know." Um, and so, you'll find that a lot of staff want to do the right thing, so they'll pay attention. Um, build this awareness, and just by doing that alone, you'll have folks kind of thinking through lots of best practices just, just by talking about it. You want to really be aware, we've talked about social engineering, be aware of, you know, folks trying to get you to do things you shouldn't do, attempt to deceive your users to do the wrong thing. Now, this email, as you can see in kind of the graphic, is, is asking for some it's, it's demonstrating social engineering, and there's a lot of clues as to you know, why this, how you can detect it as, as social engineering. Um, you know, the, the email, um, for instance, it isn't actually coming from where it's purported to coming from, so that sort of arrow number one. Um, so it, it, there's, there's sort of bad English. Um, there's links that are hidden behind sort of blue squares. So when you click on review recent activity or whatever, it'll send you to somewhere, but you can't see where necessarily when you click on the button. Um, there's no Microsoft logo. Is it really from Microsoft? This sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's great to take, uh, you know, we all recognize some level of spam, but it's great for folks that have seen like a lot of different emails that are trying to socially engineer you to do something nefarious, something wrong, um, to show those as part of a team and just have these quizzes, right? Like what's going on, um, with this email? What's wrong with it? How can you know that it's bad? Um, you know, di different emails, some emails might be, uh, you know, more, more subtle. Uh, it might seem on first glance that, 
that the email is uh, has a quick response. Looks like it's really coming from someone I know. It's coming to me. Uh, but on further study, you might again find out that the email address is a personal AOL account. Maybe that's not usual. Um, lots of clues like that. So just bring these emails to folks' attention uh, so that they're not downloading um, attachments that they shouldn't be from people they don't know. Um, what they can do if they just even have a question about an email, like what's the procedure for handling that and getting things resolved, um, things like that. So regular training sessions, regular, short, making sure folks really know what to look for and how to deal with security issues on a day-to-day -day basis, really important. Um, make sure you're incorporating security discussions into your already, the meetings you already have. We don't have to make a whole new process here, but we're bringing it in when we're talking about sort of best practices around the organization. It's just a bullet in that conversation, that, those conversations that you already have. So it becomes part of your culture, not sort of an aside or a meeting you have to go to separately you know, over time. Great. Um, so that, that gets us to those kind of risk factors that we want to we want to mitigate. Um, so then how do we dive into establishing these policies? Um, so I just want to kind of quickly go through this stuff um, uh, around policies and procedures so that we can um, look look at uh, some of the toolkit stuff in more depth uh, towards the end here and leave some time for questions. Um, first, let's form a committee. Um, make sure you've got a, a sort of a diverse array of folks working into a, 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 a diverse uh, uh, kind of a access to your information. Uh, folks that are coming from multiple angles so that you can have smart ways to approach issues. Um, I'm wondering, Elliot, just in terms of sort of establishing policies in this committee, um, what are some of the benefits you see for nonprofits in having sort of a strong committee from the start? Yeah, of course. Well, first, I uh, just wanted to frame this a little bit. Um, at the uh, this year's um, in Innovations and Technology Conference in January, um, the New York State Permanent Commission on Access to uh, Justice, uh, their, well, actually their Technology Assistance Project, um, they presented the results of a survey um, they did on information security. And um, among the results uh, were that 20% of the participants have limited or no security policies in place. Um, so on the high end, six have acceptable use policies, five have mobile or electronic device policies, five have tech information policies. And on the low end, only one program has social media, uh, computer security, voicemail, encryption, or remote access policies. 90% um, of the participants don't have security awareness program and 15 of the respondents don't have a process in place um, to keep patches current. So, you know, that that's a relatively small sample, but we see here the need to like really form committees and uh, we need to form committees to establish policies um, and committees that meet regularly to keep those established policies up to date. Uh, so, one place I might start once you have a committee is by checking out uh, NIST resources, and that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, such as their cybersecurity framework. And then also a resource that um, Google uh, just launched a couple days ago. It's called web.dev, and it's a bed of various uh, website reporting tools that lets you examine your website load times, um, your network resilience, security, um, how easily you can be discovered and your accessibility. That's great. And uh, yeah, I just saw that uh, that Google research as well. Thanks for uh, bringing that out. Um, cool. Yeah, so make sure you're asking tough questions. Uh, ask the hard question. What would you do if, um, you know, make sure the team is aware that you're looking for uh, better ways to manage security. That means you're going to find ways where you, your team feels they're deficient. It's not it's not meant to be a blame game. This is meant for everyone to just say, here's where we're at, and we all want to help to make it better, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, so make sure that's clear to folks or folks feel free to speak. Um, what will prevent a breach? Uh, you know, brainstorm with your team. How might a breach occur? What kind of blocks will you throw up to prevent those from happening? And, you know, think through these, brainstorm them, uh, and start thinking about how you can create processes and procedures for mitigating those sort of before the breach happens. But we also want to look at what's going to happen after the breach. So let's make a plan. Um, when we're in urgent or emergency situations, it becomes a lot more difficult to, to think through all the issues you're kind of reacting. 
And the point of having a really solid plan in these situations is to think through a lot of the heady issues and the, and the operating procedures in front of that crisis so that you can kind of focus on all the um, other kinds of unexpected things that come up. You've, you've already planned for the planned things. Um, that really helps a lot. Uh, you also want to make sure you're you're writing your own uh, you know user guide user guide for you know bring your own device uh, scenarios. Are you allowing that? Probably. Um, you'll want to continue to allow this in the age of smart devices. But let's make those guidelines. Consider mobile device management and how that's set up. Um, you know, and, and and so you you feel safer and that folks are aware of what you know what their responsibilities are for when they're actually introducing these devices. Uh, into uh, the office. Uh, just from the toolkit, and uh, Angela will talk about this in, the, in a few minutes here, but um, just briefly to point this out, the toolkit um, on page 24 uh, has a, a personal device policy template. Um, so it just helps you walk you through those questions and exposes you to, um, you know, just a framework for getting those answered. And then you can, eventually you come out with your own, you know, acceptable use policy that can help guide your organization. So uh, check that out. Remember that um, even processes require maintenance similar to software. So just make sure your team knows what the processes are and knows them well. So that means conducting refreshers uh, often and for the long term. Critique your processes and make them better over time. So you want to update them uh, just to make them better even if systems don't change. But as systems do change, they'll definitely need to be updated so that you're handling those kind of new technologies and new processes and procedures that for managing the information itself. For policy examples, you can go to this uh, this Bitly link. Um, I, I noticed a couple of those uh, links um, uh, aren't aren't working, um, and, and I'm not familiar with the resources. So I just wanted to share a couple of the links that um, that are, some are included on that list and some aren't. So that I like. Um, so I'm just sending those out now. Um, so, but anyway, there's some resources there um, for uh, security policy examples for, for making your own uh, policy documents at, in addition to what's in the toolkits themselves. Okay, great. So now we're at this uh, uh, section where we wanted to talk a little bit more about these uh, legal aid technology toolkits. Um, and uh, Angela, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe you'll be in a good position to talk about this now. I could probably drive the slides for you if you want, uh, just because yeah. I have it all up, up and ready. That would be perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, um, in 2016, uh, my program, the Michigan Advocacy Program, um, applied for a technology grant from LSC and it was awarded. And the, what, what came of that is a joint effort between IdeaWare and the Michigan Advocacy Program to create four toolkits to help legal aid organizations evaluate and implement specific technology solutions many of which are recommended by the LSC technology baselines. Um, the toolkits uh, can help program leaders understand the benefits of specific operations and service delivery technologies. The toolkits demystify the implementation processes and help people make smart decisions for their programs. Um, the toolkits also serve as roadmaps um, for any organization considering adopting the featured technology or looking to improve or update an older technology or system. Um, we created four of these toolkits. Uh, one is on modern information security, which you heard a lot about today. Um, the other three cover triage and online intake, um, knowledge management, and hotline call center technology. Can you move the slide forward? Um, each toolkit provides a brief explanation of the technology and the benefits from implementing it. Um, it walks you through key decision points organizations might face as you move forward, including goal and requirements definitions, defining processes and business rules, hardware and software selection, implementation, managing staff input during the process, training and user adoption, and maintenance planning. Um, the toolkits have checklists, case studies. Um, you can go back, go back one. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Here we go. Um, yeah, so we wanted them to be really practical guides, and so they have worksheets, um, as you can see here, and you saw a little bit um, earlier. We have quizzes, um, uh, temple, or sorry, templates, um, and samples of key documents, uh, checklists, 
um, sample policies, and lots of other just really practical tools that can help um, you on the ground if you're working with these. Um, let me say a little bit more about um, the other three toolkits. Triage and online intake um, covers uh, online triage, um, online intake in various, in, in the different iterations that they appear. Um, and with it has case studies um, from different organizations um, showing different models and some best practices. Knowledge management looks at uh, brief banks, sample pleadings, electronic access to practice guides, document assembly, um, and again, looking at some things that are in place. And hotline call center technology goes through um, sort of uh, phone technologies, but even beyond that to uh, programs that are using texting, um, doing uh, using hotline call centers and combined with online intake um, and things like that. Each of these toolkits was thoroughly researched. Um, here you can see a page from um, one of the toolkits, all the, all the people who the authors uh, talked with in creating the toolkit. And it, they're really specifically made for legal aid programs. Um, the primary goal of the toolkits is to engage directors of legal aid programs. So we wrote the guides very conversationally. You don't have to have a lot of technical experience to, to really benefit from what they have to offer. Um, we hope that uh, directors will read these review them, and, and if they want to implement them, um, pass them on to their IT staff, contractors, um, and others who will actually do the work. Um, the toolkits are available on the LSNTAP website. They're also available on the Idealware website. Um, we shared them through email, and uh, every executive director of an LSC-funded program um, should have gotten a short booklet sort of explaining the four, the four different toolkits and where they're available. Um, the toolkits have information that can be used um, by organizations of all sizes um, and all budgets. So um, go forward one more slide. They are portable. They're downloadable as PDFs. Um, we do have, um, we do have um, as part of the grant, we have, um, we will form committees of people to review them periodically to make sure the information is still up to date because technology changes so rapidly um, and we wanted them to be online resources because um, so that we would be able to make updates and modifications as the world changes. But they're also um, very easy to print um, and take home and read if paper is a better option for you or for someone in your program who you'd like to influence. Um, all four are available now. And um, if you do read them or use them, please uh, take a minute to give us feedback. Um, there are surveys linked um, with the downloads. Um, you know it's a TIG project, so we have to collect uh, feedback and pass it on to um, not just LSC, but our LSC's funders. So please let us know. Um, if these toolkits are helpful to you, if you use them, um, um, we may contact you to talk a little bit more about um, you know, what projects you went on to do after reading the toolkits. Um, and if anyone has any questions, they should feel free to reach out to me. And that's it. Thank great. you. Thank you so much for uh, going through all those toolkits. Those are great resources. I want to um, let's just have a moment um, for for folks that, that are on, on online live now um, to uh, ask questions or and, and also it'd be, it'd be interesting to share if, if you can, uh, if you're gonna take security steps um, now, um, you're thinking about some security steps you wanna take, maybe you can chat those uh, as well. But it, certainly if you have questions, chat those, uh, ask the question or share with us as well uh, any security steps you're gonna be taking. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, get some links as well that I want to put up, put out there in the chat while, while you're um, asking your questions if there are any. So these are some additional resources that should be helpful to, uh, to folks today. Um, you can just in there. Yeah, so one, one of the things we've done here um, at LSMTAP, we went for a team um, version of LastPass um, that we're using uh, internally and then also with contractors. And then we also did at our all staff a five minute 
um, short talk about password managers and pointed out three of the free ones and then have offered um, for anybody who uh, decides to use one of those to kind of walk them through, help them set it up. Um, so we're starting to get a little bit of adoption there. Um, I still think a best practice would really be to use an enterprise um, version internally because when you uh, remove staff, it is, or when staff leaves, it's so much easier to clean that stuff up. The amount of time that you save as opposed to going and having to check all accounts or see who shared passwords and which ones need to be changed is so much easier. Uh, but it does have that outlay of cost per seat or cost per user for the enterprise versions. Yeah, that's great. And then here's um, the additional resources I just put in. Um, these 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 uh, hyperlinks actually I just put into the chat. So, um, but here's the titles um, for those as well. So uh, th these are some uh, other uh, ex uh, resources from some from Idealware and some externally as well uh, that you can check out. Um, and just as a, a you know, a reminder, maybe just to sort of just putting a little bit of sanity or practicality in here, you know, a perfect security, you know, isn't possible. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking small steps and we're thinking about long term continual improvement. You know, really, we want to work on changing bad habits into good ones. If we can get some few simple, important, you know, good habits going. Uh, and folks keep doing those good habits, then then, then you've really done a, a, a very long-term solution to to some security problems. Uh, uh, so, so don't beat yourself up if, if you feel like there's a million risks and you're only mitigating a couple of them. Uh, that's great, and just keep working. Um, so as far as reaching out um, uh, for to to find Idealware, you can go to idealware.org. Uh, again, lots of great trainings there um, and and write-ups on all kinds of technology topics, uh, facebook.com slash idealware or at idealware uh, on Twitter. Um, you can find me, I'm at fivepaths.com. You can write me at eric at fivepaths.com uh, if you'd like to ask me any questions. Um, that That's great as well. I wanted to uh, thank everybody for uh, being available today and, and listening in, and especially uh, thank you, uh, Elliot and uh, Angela, for uh, speaking today and uh, offering all your resources. Really appreciate it. Definitely. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'd also like to offer that uh, we talked a lot about the kit here, um, but for YouTube, I would be happy to kind of condense um, some of the key points into kind of a five-minute video at some point um, to kind of do a promotional on our YouTube channel for um, any of the kits that we're looking at, but including the security kit. Uh, in particular, I think it's a very useful resource and whatever we can do to promote it and get it out there to more people, we're happy to do. That would be great. Thank you so much, Sark. Yeah, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, there is a survey coming after this. We are about to start accepting proposals for next year. Uh, so if there are topics that you want to see, um, look for a survey that we're gonna send out to the entire community here in the next week or so, asking for what topics you're interested in upcoming webinars for next year. Great, well thank you very much everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your day. All right, you too.